start? Yeah, let's, let's start. Um, should we do a basic round of intros and then carry on? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I am Rahul. I'm a product manager at Aztec Labs. We're building a decentralized privacy layer two on Ethereum. Um, yeah, we're, we have a local developer environment. We call it the sandbox. After that, it's testnet and then mainnet. We're planning to launch fully decentralized and trying to get a system of decentralized provers and sequences. What about you, Nick? I'm Nick White. I'm the COO at Celestia Labs. Uh, and we've built uh, Celestia, which is the first modular blockchain network. And Celestia's thesis is essentially that we should be breaking down the components of blockchains uh, into separate protocols that can be specialized and then recombined to be custom uh, for the different applications that people want to build. And Celestia specifically focuses on the data availability layer. Uh, and data availability, the way you can think about it is it's, it's like block space. It's like the base security um, that any L2 or rollup needs to consume in order to operate their chain. And so Celestia has built specifically this new cryptographic primitive called data availability sampling. And uh, it's kind of the, the technology that enables Celestia to scale in a new way that allows for verifiability even when block sizes are really, really big. So Celestia is like this. Think of it as an L1 that's been purpose built to scale and secure rollups. Do you like, so you guys launched recently, congratulations on that, by the way. Um, do you see a lot of like new use cases? Like are people using inscriptions for Celestia? Or do you see like L3s getting meaningful adoption on Celestia? Yeah, so the, uh, one of the first <laughs> people to, uh, projects to consume a large amount of block space on Celestia was an inscriptions project. Of course. Uh, it seems to be a, a common pattern. Um, but currently, the main use case for Celestia has been uh, Ethereum L2s who wanted to uh, sort of have a cheaper option for data availability because pre-EIP 4844, like 99% of uh, L2s costs were data availability on Ethereum because call data was so expensive. So many uh, Ethereum L2s uh, shifted to posting their data to Celestia, and that reduced their cost dramatically. Uh, and so across like over uh, 10 to 12 rollups that have migrated, they saved uh, a combined total of maybe 5 million or so uh, dollars in, in data availability fees. Um, in terms of the new stuff, uh, there's a lot coming in the pipeline. Um, there's, we're probably going to talk about this more. But um, in general, there's, the, there's this, uh, I would say, th theme of applications moving onto their own chains. Because essentially what rollups allow you to do is to launch your own chain that is uh, specialized for your own application um, and also gives you sort of like this uh, dedicated block space. So you don't have to worry about the congestion that could be caused by other applications on a shared execution layer. And as the application developer, you get to uh, capture the fees that you're generating. So uh, instead of giving those fees to the shared execution layer that you built on, you can capture them yourselves. Um, and I think that so all, all of those uh, elements are uh, driving a lot of application developers to build their application as a roll-up. Um, and that's something that Celestia is trying to uh, support by providing secure modular data availability for L3s. Um, so that's, that's something that I'm excited about. And very, this is like, that's a really big theme, especially in the Ethereum ecosystem. Yeah, I think there's like, at least from my perspective, like Aztec private transactions, they create a lot of data. Like pre-bobs, pre-blobs, pre it's not even possible with call data. So we need like, blobs may cut it, but we're scared it might take a lot, right? So like another use case I feel like is just like, when you have too much data, because Ethereum may not have enough bandwidth until tank sharding, presumably. Um, you mentioned L3s. I have a few L3 hot takes. I want to hear your L3 hot takes. But um, is there much difference between an L2 using Celestia versus an L3 using Celestia? So I think. Or any other DA. 
Yeah. Yeah, the, the terminology of L2 versus L3 or even L4, or like you can have an L infinity. Like there's no, all, all that the, the number connotes is like where the roll up is settling to. And if the roll up, all roll ups are going to post their data to some DA layer, whether that's Celestia or Ethereum or something else. And that's actually where the security is derived from. And then the, like an L2 is called an L2 because it settles to the L1. An L3 is called an L3 because it settles to an L2, and so on. And so um, it's like L3s are not really very different to L2s, but people, but the, the mental model that that, that enumeration creates uh, is, is like kind of mis misleading, I think. Yeah, like a lot of their functionality is similar, especially if you're thinking about an optimistic L2, like an optimistic rollup, right? Like all of the data just straight up goes into L1 anyway, or wherever you choose to settle, so it doesn't really save much as well, I feel like. Um, do you like, so one of my hot takes is like, I don't understand a lot of the pros of L3 other than like if you have a chain that doesn't have that much use, then you can amortize with L2, right? Like Arbitrum's really busy, you're building an Arbitrum L3, your chain is obviously not as busy as Arbitrum, you just take the bus. Um, do you see any other pros? Yeah, I think there's, a, there's, well, one thing is settlement can actually be expensive. For example, if you settle on Ethereum uh, mainnet, especially if you're a ZK rollup, right? Uh, verifying those proofs can be expensive. It's a lot of gas, right? So there's an advantage to settling your ZK proofs on an L2 where gas is cheaper. So from that perspective, you know, being an L3 could, could actually be helpful. Um, the other thing that L3s are good for is like, let's say I'm an Arbitrum, uh, you know, how, how did L2 start is like they're trying to scale Ethereum, right? And, but now the L2s themselves, some of them are getting congested, like base, for example. Um, and so now if I'm an application on base and I want to have dedicated block space and not suffer from congestion issues on the base L2, I can spin up a base L3, essentially, where I'm still connected to the base ecosystem, right? So I'm settling to base. So could I'm you not have to the, a parallel base L2? You could, but I think you, you, if, if your community and uh, your users and your, the assets you know, for like your application bias, yeah. are coming from base, then it makes sense for you to settle directly to base. Also, like, you know, for example, base or Arbitrum, they might have integrations with exchanges or, you know, uh, have USCC natively issued on their chain that you want to connect to as well. So there's a reason why you would choose to settle there specifically. And it could be Vibes-based. It could just be community-based as yeah. well. You want to align with base or Arbitrum or, or whatever. Yeah, like the ones I've seen so far seem more with alignment or Vibes. We just, we just want to be associated with base or Arbitrum because they're cool. Right, so like those kinds of things make sense, but like technical standpoint. So you mentioned something where um, you can reduce a lot of costs by settling on L2 as an L3, but like if for an optimistic rollup, the same call data goes all the way to L1, right? So it's like it's unclear to me how much money would you actually save compared to just being your own L2, I guess, for an optimistic rollup specifically. Well, well, all rollups will still have to post their data to some DA layer. Uh, so yeah, you don't really, other than the settlement thing that I mentioned, you won't, yeah. you won't really save, save much money. Yeah, that makes sense. I think, I think we're quite aligned on our L3 ideas, which is cool. Um, something I think a lot about Aztec is like, how can we build this system that's extremely credibly neutral and censorship resistant because we're privacy chain. Um, we want to make sure that things do not get censored in a weird way. Um, do you think like introducing all these other systems that happens with modularity, right? So for example, like let's say I'm building a rollup, I'm settling on Ethereum, but using Celestia for DA. Um, I'm also using Espresso for shared sequencer. Um, Espresso uses Eigenlayer. So it's like a five system mix pretty common. Um, do you feel like the, there are a lot of trade-offs now because of this modularity thing? Like, 
probably more DevOps, more admin, more um, censorship like problems? Or do you not think like, do you think it can all be managed easily? I don't think there's a generic answer to that because it, you know, the one thing about modularity is that there's just so many different combinations of the different pieces and there's so many different designs that you can't really make a blanket statement about all, all of them. Uh, but I, what I would say is that um, in general, it's true that especially right now in the stage of development that the modular stack is, there's a, a great amount of complexity because there's a bunch of different components. Um, the interfaces between them are not like sort of like solidified yet. And so even I integrating between you know, different DA layers and execution layers or sequencing layers is still hard and, um, and not easy. And, and so um, when you want to launch a chain, it's not just you know, does the chain function. You need also to have indexers and block explorers. And uh, someone needs to actually host the nodes of your rollup and, and all of that auxiliary stuff. And so that like overall, the, you know, the, the, the end goal is to make it as easy to deploy your own chain as it is to deploy a smart contract. We're still pretty far away from that. But the good, the good news is that there are uh, teams that are building um, a service called Rollups as a Service. Yes. And essentially what they do is they are the system integrators where they take all these different things, they test them, they uh, make sure that they're uh, like uh, secure and stable enough to sort of be deployed and used by developers as an end product. And so they're doing a lot of the work of, they're not building any, any layer themselves or any component themselves, they're just tying it all together into a finished yeah. product. And I think that's, that's like a really important service that the modular stack is in desperate need of right now. And, and frankly, they're actually pretty far along where like you could go to Conduit or Caldera um, and in a few clicks deploy your own blockchain uh, and choose between a bunch of different options for data availability, for you know, what kind of execution environment you want to have. And you can customize different aspects. And uh, you know, in literally minutes, you could have your own roll up. Yeah, th that blew my mind. When Arbitrum Orbit first launched, it's just a UI, and you click four buttons, and you have an L3 or an L2. I was amazed. That, that was shocking. Um, you mentioned indexers. Tangent. Um, are indexers relevant for Celestia? So the Celestia L1, sor sort of, but not really, because um, you know, there's not much there's not really much execution happening on Celestia that you would want to index. It's yeah. all like, the only things that happen on the, so, so the Celestia layer one has as minimal amount of execution as it can have to be useful for its you know, main purpose, which is for people to run rollups on it. So all it has at the L1 are staking transactions, pay for blob transactions, which are basically like how you pay to consume block space to post like publish data on Celestia, and um, that's pretty much it. Oh, yeah, you can also transfer TIA tokens between addresses, um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so there's not that much to index. But what's interesting is how, like, the question of how do you, in a modular world, like, how do you provide indexing and block explorers out of the box yeah. for different rollups? And there are teams that are kind of focusing on that problem. Um, and figuring out ways to make uh, indexing kind of like adaptable or lock explorers adaptable to uh, like the, talk to different systems in your stack, basically. Yeah, well, they, like they could. Well, you you could, for example, register your rollups like as an execution model with like this generalized indexer thing, and it could learn. You could tell it basically. Here's how to interpret my block data and index it. Um, and so in that way, it can be flexible. So it's not just like limited to EVM or some other specific execution model. I see. Would it, like I love this idea of like, are we scan? Like let's say I have Arbitrum Orbit that uses Celestia. Like I love the idea of Arbit scan also showing the proof of not just settlement of my transaction, but also like what happened in Celestia. Um, I think that is also like probably an underexplored area 
with these modular systems that we call. Um, yeah, like, are there any, like, would you call the quantum gravity bridge, I forget what it's called now, is it Blobstream? Blobstream, yeah. Would you call Blobstream a kind of indexer for Ethereum to read what's happening on Celestia? No, it's more, it's more of like a bridge, basically. So uh, Blobstream is this uh, data availability bridge that um, we've built. And essentially what it does is it allows Ethereum or any EVM chain to be able to uh, verify that some data was published on Celestia. And the reason that matters is that that enables someone who wants to have, like, settle their, if they want to have a rollup that uses Celestia's DA, but settles to, say, Ethereum or Base or Arbitrum, um, they're going to deploy their bridge contract to that chain. They're, that bridge contract needs to know before it accepts any kind of uh, state transition, like uh, state proof, basically, from that rollup that the data, corresponding data, was published on, on Celestia. So what Blobstream does is it uh, enables that to happen. So you post your data to Celestia, it gets bridged over to that other chain, and the other chain can verify the data was published. So um, it's a critical functionality to enable like, off-chain data availability. That makes sense. What's, um, what's next in the protocol improvements of Celestia? There's a lot. So um, to keep it high level, um, the, the, one of the you know, core value propositions of Celestia is to have abundant block space. And uh, you know, currently, the block size is only 2 megabytes uh, every like 12 seconds. And that's really not enough throughput for where we want to go, which is to have you know, millions of rollups some, sometime in the future. Um, in the near term, maybe like a thousand rollups would be pretty amazing to have. Wow. Um, but, but even like, you know, two megabyte blocks is nowhere near enough. And we always want to be ahead of the curve so that when, you know, if we ever, and I think we will eventually, come out with some application for Web3 that really has product market fit and has some kind of like viral adoption curve, we're going to need to have we, we, we don't want to be in the situation where we hit scale fail and all of a sudden like that, that, that application kind of falls flat. So Celestia always wants to be ahead of the curve and have more block space than we need in, case, like, in preparation for that event. And so um, we're scaling. Our current protocol can scale to about like four to eight megabytes. So we can, we can scale further from where we are, but we want to get to our next sort of milestone is to scale to about 100 megabyte blocks. Or, or like this is with KZG commitments, or uh, no? So we don't have KZG commitments. We have uh, just erasure coding and fraud proofs for the encoding. Um, so that's a big one. Is just like scaling that's the block still size still pretty complex and pretty cool? Yeah. So the scaling the block size is a big one. Um, we are also adding pruning, which will make the nodes lighter to operate and run. Because if you if all the uh, nodes have to store all the uh, data, the history of the chain, then uh, like with such big blocks, you start to have a very heavy chain in terms of storage, not state, but like storage. And so pruning is going to be a really big improvement. Um, we're doing small things that uh, make the networking for sampling more efficient. And but the, I would say probably the coolest thing that we're going to we're, we're actively working on as an active CIP for is adding a zk. Uh, verification functionality to the base layer. And what that does is, because Celestia doesn't have any execution natively on its chain, there's no way to bridge uh, the TIA token into rollups uh, in a trust minimized way. It's like Ethereum has smart contracts, so you can actually have uh, these trust minimized bridges with rollups, and Celestia doesn't have smart contracts. Um, and the reason we don't have smart contracts is we don't want to have state and execution. Uh, and all this heaviness on the Celestia L1. We want to be as minimal as possible. And we can achieve that. We can maintain the goal of, of being minimal while enabling uh, a trust minimized bridging and some other interesting applications by adding the ability to verify ZK proofs on the Celestia L1. So you could, you could have like these ZK bridges, essentially, uh, between the L1 and, and the, the broader ecosystem. This could also enable. Uh, interesting use cases like restaking. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how people 
leverage that. But I think that's like the, the last missing piece to make Celestia as like, like this really universal uh, and like full, fully expressive base layer while still being so super, super minimal. That makes sense. You mentioned pruning. I'm curious, does anyone here know much about vertical trees or some of the work like that's been talking about? Yeah, like um, I think recently people have been talking a lot about pruning, right? Like Ethereum's going this vertical tree approach where you have a polynomial commitment in your trees so you don't need to actually store individual data. Um, Maiden and Aztec are thinking about like this nullifier pruning thing where um, so we have like two trees instead of one state tree, like it's a UTXO model, right? It's like you create a transaction, it creates data, you destroy some UTXOs, the destruction lives in a separate tree, so you have more privacy set. But like that means your state is just gonna keep growing massively. Um, I think Arbitrum had this really interesting approach of, I think it was pure research, where they said, we will just like, if you haven't interacted with the chain for a few years, we'll remove your state from get or whatever your execution client is. And before you can interact again, you have to hit refresh, basically. You do a transaction, refresh your state into get, and then continue. What model works for you guys in pruning? Because it's a vast design space. Yeah, so the... So sort of what you're just what you're describing is more of like state expiration mm. or state pruning, and um, the the nice thing about Celestia is that we have very very little state. We're like Bitcoin, where um, there's just account balances essentially is the, uh, the extent of state. There's no like contracts or you know contract state to store. So the pruning that we do, we I mean we hope that we don't ever run into a place where the state becomes so big that we have to worry about that. Maybe, maybe that, that, that could happen uh, in the future, but the pruning that we do is more the history of the chain pruning. So you don't, it's similar, like Ethereum is also... Archive note? So, or? Yeah, exactly. So like a lot of protocols like Ethereum or Bitcoin, the full node software stores all of the, the chain history. And... Um, in Celestia, that, that was the case, but now we're, we're, we want to prune after a certain, basically, I think, 21 days or something. We don't want to store any of the history beyond that. Or it's optional. You can configure your node to be an archival node and store all the, all the history if you want, but by default, uh, it will, it's just removed after a certain period of time. So that means that, like, so, because imagine, like, if you have two megabyte blocks every 10 seconds, you know, for 21 days, that adds up pretty pretty quickly. Extreme. Now if you start having 100 megabyte, megabyte blocks, that really starts to you know, add up. So, yeah. but, but also, I, w I also want to mention that um, in, in Celestia's case, you don't always, in order to verify the chain, you don't have to run a full node. You can run what's called a light node. And all the light node does is it samples a very, very small, like less than 1% of the block data. And that's all that you would need to like, sample and store if you're running a light node. So it, that, that's also still very, very light. But even, even on a light node, uh, if, if the chain is long, it can add up to a lot of data. That makes sense. Uh, how much time do we have left, actually? We have five minutes. Uh, um, do we want to open up to questions? Yeah, or let's have some questions. If anyone has If any. people have questions. All right, everyone has it figured out. Wow. Um, Anyone have a question? Raise your hand. No questions for Celestia? Don't be shy. It can be a funny question. <laughs> we can't ask you when token because um, <laughs> you mentioned 1,000 roll-ups. Like, that's something that still scares me for some reason. It's like I don't understand. Like, there's so much work that needs to be done for bridging and state clients to make that work. Um, it blows my mind. It's like, but I think that's the way systems work, right? You first like build something, then you realize the problems, yeah. then you're on repair mode, then you build more things, go back to the repair mode. 
Um, but I'm interested to see how that space evolves. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of actually very valid criticisms of rollups and, and the modular stack today. But the thing is that all of the problems have like known and tractable solutions. And so uh, to me, it's only a matter of time that all those problems get solved. And when they are solved, the modular stack will just blow everything else out of the water. Um, but it's, it's like, it's true that today there are still problems like this, like the proofs like for rollups are, are not great. Like ZK proofs are actually making uh, a real, uh, like a, an extreme amount of progress, but they're still, they're still be lagging and, behind and expensive, but, but like the progress has actually been way faster than I think anyone anticipated. Um, the bridging, I think like ZK proofs will also make bridging a lot better, but bridging and interoperability, especially from the user experience side, of you know having different accounts across different chains or having transactions that have to touch state on a bunch of different chains like all, those things are still not very good um, but there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff for example happening in the cosmos ecosystem that uh, demonstrates ways to solve these problems um, and so I think like yeah a thousand roll-ups sounds really scary it sounds like a UX nightmare it sounds like all these things but like to me it's a matter of time before all that gets gets solved and we don't think about it that way. Yeah, that makes sense. I think, do you have a question or? Uh... Yeah, thanks. Hi. Uh, just curious here. If we're talking about millions of rollups, so that means that there will be a lot of data that validators actually need to store, even though when the pruning is implemented, still there will be a lot of data. Uh, so because you are based on Tendermint, right, if I understand correctly, it is very hard actually to achieve huge number of validators. Um, currently you have, I think, 100 validators. Maybe there will be more, but even the top Tendermint chains, they have, I think, 150 or so. Uh, assuming sharding is implemented, I, I don't know if, it's, if Celestia has it or each validator has the entire replica of the entire, entire data. Do you see this as a problem? Like. Um, um, I don't know if my question is clear, like uh, number of validators is very limited uh, and the amount of data that you need to store is growing if we're talking about millions of rollups. Um, how are you going to solve this challenge or is it a problem at all? Is it clear or I can repeat? So I didn't follow your question fully, partly because of the audio, but uh, there's one part about the number of validators, which I'll address. So. Um, Celestia currently has 100 validators. And um, for a long time, I think people thought that oh, it was really important to have a really large validator set. Like, you know, Ethereum really optimized for that in their new proof of stake protocol. Uh, the thing is that inherently, oftentimes, the, the number of validators that actually, like, the, the way to think about it is how many validators in total sum up to certain thresholds of stake, right? So 33% of stake or 66% of stake are sort of like the two big um, thresholds that matter. And oftentimes, even if you have a 10,000 validators, the top 10 validators add up to 33% of stake or the top 20 or something. So those mo next marginal validators beyond that point actually are not really contributing meaningfully to decentralization. That's not to say that it's not a, like, it, what that means is basically it's equally important to decentralize the stake of the system among different validators as it is to increase the total size of the validator set. And oftentimes, the more important problem for proof of stake protocols, even Ethereum today, is to decentralize the stake. Um, on the storage part, I didn't really follow, but I think we're, we're out of time. So if you want, we can talk over here. And I'm uh, happy to answer your question. OK, thanks. Yeah, for what it's worth, um, Ethereum's actually trying to reduce the number of validators. They have this new proposal of increasing their stake just because it's becoming too much to handle, too many propagation of signatures. Um, just like in general, I guess, lower the number of validators, higher control you have over bandwidth. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question uh, while we're waiting for our next speaker, if anyone has another question. Yeah, back here. Uh, hey, Nick, thanks. This is actually kind of a funny question. There was like a narrative going on earlier this year. Is it true you hacked the CIA when you were 12? 
That's not me. That's uh, so <laughs> Mustafa, who's the uh, co-founder of Celestia and wrote the original Lazy Ledger white paper. He was uh, when uh, as a teenager a hacktivist, part of Anonymous, and then later he co-founded a hacker group called Lulzsec, which uh, hacked you know federal uh, contractors and exposed you know uh, compromising. Like th things about like the federal contractors were doing very shady things. Um, they hacked various multinational corporations uh, in protest of like pri privacy and sort of like copyright issues. As well as, as, well as like, he did a bunch of hacktivism. Uh, at one point, they DOSed the they DDoSed the uh, CIA website uh, and took it down. But they didn't hack it. But uh, yeah, M M Mustafa's a badass. <laughs> he was like I think 16 at the time. Yeah, you don't mess with Mustafa. All right, any final questions? All right. Thank you guys so much for doing the panel. Thank you guys. I'll be sticking around if you want to talk. Thank you. Just outside. <laughs>